right, we're live. We are live. Hello from the Outer Banks. Happy Mother's Day to everybody out there. Zero. You're talking to nobody. One. Okay. You always do. Well, just wait for them to get here because <laughs> I want you to say that all again. I know. I'm going to say it all again. Guess what? We get to edit. Trim. We'll trim that part. Yeah. This part. Yeah. Well, let's get going. People will join. I see the Comptons are on already. Hi, y'all. Hi, Matt Compton. How are you? Happy Mother's oh, Day. No sound, it says. Oh, wonder why. All right. How about, no, that doesn't have anything to do with it. Is that better? Hey, Matt, can you hear us all right? Can you hear us? We're watching your chat, Matt. <laughs> all right. Still one person. Well, I'm concerned about the audio. I'm not on mute. Yep. Matt, can you hear us? Let's test that out really quick. I can type. You stay in the picture. Okay, we can hear now. Oh, awesome. All right, well, let's give it a go. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day to everybody. Welcome back to the Outer Banks. This is Fork Mike Knife. I'm Cheryl Bunce. And I'm Bill Bunce. And we are really excited about today's show and I really appreciate you taking the time to watch live or watch when it is out on video. So after the last show, which was two weeks ago with the Hungry Songbird, uh, also known as Flagship Romance, um, I'll have to say Cheryl got pretty excited, um, <laughs> pulled out a piece of paper uh, and we generated a list of, I was just counting, about 20 other friends that we could cook with. Uh, and not soon after that, we placed the call to our good friends in Spring Lake, Michigan, who own a music venue called Seven Steps Up. So yes, please amazing. welcome uh, Gary and Michelle. Oh. <laughs> welcome. Hey guys. Hi. Hi, Hi. there. It's so good to see you. We're very excited. And we just gave a quick in, in, uh, introduction to Seven Steps Up and uh, that you are Gary and Michelle. We're really excited to have you guys on today and looking forward to the adventures in our respective kitchens uh, between Michigan and North Carolina. The cool thing is that we've been in your kitchen and you've cooked in our kitchen. I know, how exciting. We were just m remembering today the meals that we cooked with you and that you've cooked with us. And it's kind of fun and, to do this, even though we're not there with each other. And my favorite was with you, Tayson. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember the first time we met, we were introduced, I'm pretty sure it was Tony Luca, right? I think so. On the rock boat. Um, I remember Tony came up to us and said, you guys just have to meet Michelle and Gary from Seven Steps Up because you guys are, you're going to get along. I know you're going to be long lost friends. And we <laughs> met, I think it was brunch on the rock boat. And this would have been at least five years ago, probably. Yeah. And I agree with Tony. We became uh, fast, friends. fast friends. Instant. And I believe we were watching Eric Baker. We were. Actually, we were. Brother. And we were at one of the high top tables down in Bar City. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We turned yeah. to each other and realized that we were who each other were. <laughs> right. We had been looking for you. And it was like, oh, my God, you're them. No. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's funny. So why don't you tell us a little bit about Seven Steps Up? You know, when did you guys uh, create Seven Steps Up? Why? And... <laughs> Where'd you go, Gary? <laughs> Michelle's like, you're part of Seven Steps Up. Um, I, and the other I, thing is, go ahead. Well, Tell us a little bit about it. Seven Steps Up started because of problems that we had opening up our venue. I'm sorry, the music part of Seven Steps Up started because of issues that we had um, opening up our venue. Originally, the venue was designed for corporate events, weddings, fundraisers that's what we thought that it would be and um very very long story we decided to have a concert because we didn't have any other events and said you know if this goes okay maybe we'll do a couple a year and we've now in 10 years done over 540 shows wow that's incredible that's amazing well yeah. it is 
probably one of my favorite venues in all honesty. The room is warm, but it's really the two of you that just make it. You, know, you give it the heartbeat uh, that I think everybody in your area really wanted to see. Um, and it's just a really special place. Thank you. So, so people may not realize that the venue is your home. You Right now, you're above the venue. You live above the venue. Yes. One, of, one of the things that's unique that you guys do that we hear from the artists is um, you feed the artists dinner, typically after the show, uh, upstairs where, where you live. Um, I know sometimes they've actually stayed there. But, you know, sometimes they stay at the Holiday Inn down the street. But typically after the show, you you feed the artists upstairs. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, that is the most common scenario is that we have dinner after the show. The green room, our loft turns into the green room the day of the show. And so pre-show, we put 20. it out. Gary, you <clears throat> picked out a um, array of snacks and then we do the show and then I make dinner and so oftentimes these traveling musicians they're not eating the best they're not get they're certainly not getting fresh food one of the things I've said is I've brought grown men to tears who have said I haven't seen green things on my plate in over you know two weeks <laughs> we it's a home cooked meal we try to use um, as fresh of ingredients today we're using the majority of our our, our ingredients are from a local farm crisp country acres and we try to do that all year that's awesome and you know the one thing that they don't get from us having them in our home as well is uh, attention to any special dietary needs so oh. you know you're able to know that way ahead of time and you get to curate a dinner for them that i'm sure just really hits home uh, when they know that they're going to be able to eat <laughs> vegetarian vegan celiac uh pescatarian keto keto, keto. whole free. 30 you know yes so All of it. <laughs> whatever whatever they advance whatever we know in advance then we will uh, we will um definitely yeah. do that well that's exciting thanks for giving us a little bit of insight you're welcome so um the dish that you've decided to make today um and we're kind of built what we're going to make around that is something that you've made um, for artists before, right? Why don't you tell us a little bit about the dish? This is one of mine and Gary's personal favorites. We make it, I don't even know how many times we've had it during quarantine at this point. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it is, it's just a very simple, um, very few ingredients that I can put together very well, but it, or very quickly. And um, it's just a, a fantastic recipe. It's got fresh greens. We use far, um, chicken from the farm. We use, the grains are from the farm. We use some microgreens. We use um, roasted beets and uh, some goat cheese, not from the farm. Um, we, and then we put it all together. Normally we also have avocados, but we're very particular. And during the shutdown, we haven't been doing our own shopping. So we don't trust anyone. <laughs> yeah, I know how that is. I know how that is. Truth be told, I just planted an avocado tree yesterday. Oh, wow. That's yeah, well, we now have the Bunce Orchard going. <laughs> Excellent. It's going to be a while before we get any avocados because it's only two feet tall. But <laughs> um, So what we decided to do, we you talked about how Gary puts out a bunch of snacks. Uh, typically, when the artist comes up, there's something to nibble on right away. So what we decided to do, um, there's not a lot of cooking involved, but it can be a lot of fun, is just a fun charcuterie um, board. Uh, so we went to a local, um, what do you call Trio? Well, Trio is a market, plus yeah. it's a restaurant, plus, it's a um, plus it has the, oh. um, you know Trio. Um, they have an amazing selection of wines, beers, bubbles, uh, the whole thing. And so we went to Trio and talked to Kenny and said, this is what we're doing Sunday. Um, and a lot of folks that have either uh, attended some of our events or have been here to visit as guests know Trio very well. So uh, nice shout out to them. They helped us select some cheeses and some meats to put on there. Now, while this may not be specific to dietary considerations, you could adapt that um, based on anyone in particular that's a guest in your home or at your venue uh, to suit some different needs. So it, it can be uh, more adventurous, I'll say, uh, but we kind of stuck with some standards today. So to go with the charcuterie, 
one of the things that I decided to do is um, I'm going to take some pecans and candy them because that's uh, just a fun technique that anybody can do at home. Uh, and we're also going to just reduce some balsamic vinegar. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, no sense to buy the um, glaze. Yeah, the, yeah. the balsamic <laughs> glaze. It's just silly. You can just take balsamic vinegar and reduce it to a glaze. So we'll do that as well. Uh, and that'll go with our charcuterie. Uh, and then what do you got planned for dessert? That's how we're going to start today. You know, uh, time's too short. Eat dessert first. Well, this is, we've got a certain amount of time and we're going to get through everything we need to do today, but we're actually going to start with dessert. Uh, I'm going to get the cake in the oven. Um, and through the magic of being prepared, uh, I may have a cake already out because I knew it wouldn't cool fast enough for me. Um, but I did go ahead and give the recipe uh, its due course yesterday um, so that we could have that pre-prepared. But I'm going to walk you through the steps. So if it's okay with you guys, Michelle and Gary, um, since the cake needs to get in the oven, <laughs> if we start with the cake first, then we'll let uh, Cheryl walk us through making that cake. Does that sound good? Awesome. Great. And if you have any prep to do on your side, feel free to do so. Um, and, you know, the, what's really good is uh, our audience likes watching what's going on on both sides of the cameras. Uh, so if you've got some prep work or things you want to do on your side, feel free to do so. Just go ahead and mute uh, because, you know, I'm going to be talking. <laughs> All right. You want to come on over? Um, the cake is pretty simple. It's a it's a chocolate cake. Um, and basically what we've done is enriched it with buttermilk, um, primarily because it adds a lot of moisture, but also because it gives a little bit of a tang. Uh, we're actually doing what's called an individual Napoleon, where we're actually going to cut the cake into shapes and we're gonna stack it uh, with a layer of fresh fruit and Chantilly whipped cream, uh, put another layer of cake on, then a little more whipped cream and a garnish, um, and it'll be, uh, just a nice light way to balance the chocolate, the buttermilk tang that's in that chocolate cake, and the sweetness you're going to get naturally um, and with a little of enhancement to the fruit and the whipped cream. So I did take the time to go ahead and pre-measure. Um, one of the things that I highly recommend to you because you, you, do, you do use an unsweetened cocoa, get a good one. I love the Ghirardelli family. Um, they really make a nice product. Um, and it's 100% cocoa, so I would recommend using that. Um, so I do have baking powder, baking soda, sugar, um, flour, and I will tell you that lately Bill and I have been mixing 50-50 whole wheat and all-purpose, um, you know, bleach flour. Um, it just gives it a nice little kind of bite to it. So, you know, just a little tidbit if that's something you're adventurous and want to do. Um, I have the buttermilk and I also have olive oil. Um, many cake recipes will call for canola, vegetable, whatever. I just really like the richness of good olive oil. So just make sure you add all of that in. Um, it will another, provide the recipe. Yeah. yeah, the recipe will be provided on the website so that you can see that. This also calls for warm water. I've already preheated the water and added that in. The reason you want the water to be warm, it helps that cocoa really get together with the flour and the sugar uh, without just being separated. It makes it blend really nice. The uh, vanilla I, bought, I brought today to use, we actually purchased this past year on the rock boat when I got put in um, margarita jail. <laughs> we'll tell you that story another time. But In uh, um, what country? Honduras. Yeah, wherever that was. Um, funny story. But um, it just, it's really rich and it's vibrant. And so I wanted to make sure that that also came through in the cake. So the last thing are the two eggs. And one trick I'll, t I'll share with you, eggs can be brittle, even if they're fresh. Um, and you really don't want those shells in your batter. If you'll take the egg and do it this way, don't do it on the side of your bowl. It gives you a flat surface to be able to kind of stick your thumb in there and you notice there weren't any shells. Um, and then add them that way. That way, if you're, if you're doing it here and you're adding it in, A, you can't see that the shell fell in there, uh, and B, 
it's just much cleaner to do it this way. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and give this a mix. It's gonna take about two minutes. What do you wanna do? <laughs> Michelle, can we uh, send things back to you? Got beets here. I am, I have to roast the beets and I usually, I do it this way. I go ahead and uh, um, peel. <laughs> peel the beets before I roast them, mainly because I can do the peeling before the show and have the beets ready. And then at the end of the show, I can pop them into the oven and then it just allows me to do things a little bit quicker. There's a, you can roast them um, with the skins on. I just prefer it this way at the beginning for the, uh, for the time frame. So I just, uh, I peeled them, I just chopped them, I put them in a pan. Now, because of the pandemic, I'm running low on my really good olive oil and I wanna use it in my dressing later. So I'm actually gonna be using um, a canola, but I definitely prefer a really good olive oil for um, roasting and cooking. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make sure that everything is nicely coated. All my little pieces are coated. Um, I find that, that um, after everything cooks, they just cook more even and more, uh, they have more flavor and more, uh, they don't get as dried out. I use one of my favorite little, it's called, again, <laughs> it's the pandemic and I don't have um, a lot. I'm running out of some of the things that I normally cook with, but this is called M-Salt. It's available. It's a proprietary blend, um, actually made by someone right here in West Michigan in Grand Haven. And so I use, it's got pepper and um, some salt and um, different kinds of flavorings in it. And I use it a lot for what I just did. So now I'm going to pop it in the oven at 375 degrees. And they normally take, um, you know, anywhere from uh, 30, depending upon how, how you cut them up, but it can take 30, 40, 45 minutes to complete cooking. Um, what I've done is I've already cooked some that I will use to put together the, sal the salad in a little bit. And uh, uh, you'll want it to cook it until... It is, um, you can take a fork or a toothpick and it moves easily um, in the flesh. So now I think, are we, can we, are we ready to go back? <laughs> yeah, now? we're ready. Thanks, Michelle. Awesome. All right, send it back Thank to you guys. You. Thanks, Gary. Um, I have two um, quarter sheet pans here, two half sheet pans. Well, I forget what size they are anyway. Um, you can either use a full um, sheet pan like you would use for um, a roll-up crust uh, for a cake, that type of thing, what you would use for a cookie sheet as long as it's got sides on it like this one does. Um, I put a little bit of, I don't know about you guys, but I'm, I'm loving the coconut spray versus Pam. Um, put a little bit of that on there. And I did line mine with parchment. You know, it depends really in baking. If it's a humid day or whatever, sometimes things are just a little stickier. And if you have the parchment paper on there, it does give you a little bit more ease in making sure it comes away from uh, the pan. So I'm going to put these in a 350 degree oven and Bill's going to open that door for me. Easier said than done. Yeah. <laughs> Walking backwards. And these are going to take about 20 minutes. And I'm going to change places with Bill. And he <laughs> is going to start a raspberry coulis, which is going to be a component of the dessert. Yeah, so um, you'll see when we plate it, but um, this raspberry coulis will go on the bottom of the plate. Um, it could go on top. But um, so a, a coulis is just fruit and sugar. Um, and we've got some, some fresh raspberries that we got um, uh, locally here, and I'm just going to go ahead and put that in our in our uh, pan. Um, equal amounts weight-wise, typically, of sugar to raspberries. So how much do we have? 12 ounces. 12 ounces of sugar. Uh, and then it's, um, you know, you need to get it going. The raspberries are going to release a lot of juice, but you really got to get it going. So I've got a quarter cup, no, it looks like half, half a cup uh, of water we'll go ahead and get that going 
Um, we're going to bring it up to a boiler until the uh, raspberries um, kind of break down. And then we're going to use um, a, um, a strainer, strainer a, a fine strainer, and we're going to strain out the um, raspberry seeds. You could leave the seeds in, but it's just nicer and a little finer if you uh, strain them out, if you have um, a strainer like that. So um, while that's heating up, coming to a boil, um, I'll turn it back over to you guys. Is it time to drink? Sure. Yes, we Sounds would like love that. Today. We might join you. <laughs> okay. So we're gonna change, I'm, Gary and I are gonna switch over and he is going to show you what is the name of this drink? It's based on a drink called a madras. It's based on a drink called a madras. But I changed up some of the proportions a little bit. Um, so, I have drinks today. And I've become a big fan of these big ass ice cubes. Big ass ice cubes. Is that a technical term? That's a bartender term. Okay. So we just got some molds that make those recently. And so we're going to start with some vodka. It doesn't have to be anything real fancy, although we think this is a great vodka. 150 years in business. So, so we're going to do about an ounce and a quarter of the Smirnoff Vodka. And then the real Madras recipe calls for uh, three ounces of orange juice and three ounces of cranberry juice, but I like the cranberry juice more. So we're only gonna do two ounces of orange juice. You do need a big glass, by the way. Well, in our world. Well, if you do these, uh, oh, gotcha. These, these amounts. So, a couple ounces of orange juice and then some cranberry juice, 100% juice, not that cocktail stuff. So, there really is a difference. And so, we're going to do two and perhaps three ounces. Or we're going to do three ounces, perhaps four. There's three. We've got to save a little room for some, a couple of other items. Looks pretty cool, doesn't it? Yep. Okay, we're going to do three of cranberry, two of the orange juice. We're going to do a couple, just a tiny splash of Rose's grenadine. Um, mostly doing that, just the way it looks because it looks cool when it goes in. So if somebody's watching you bartend, it really makes a nice colorful drink. And then to give it a little fizz. I like the fizz. You could, you could use club soda. Uh, you could use some LaCroix, uh, probably lime flavored. But we're going to use uh, ginger ale today. Verner's, it's a Michigan thing, so. This is the only ginger ale you should buy. <laughs> so it's going to give it some fizz. And we're going to top it off, garnish it with a, a lime slice, like so. And a straw. In our venue now, we're using all paper straws, but we have a bunch of these in the loft that we want to get rid of. So just stir it up a little bit. Isn't that beautiful? Awesome. Thank you, Gary. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> that looks awesome, guys. <laughs> so... Well, you guys were making the drink. Um, we, um, Cheryl, started a uh, whipped cream that we're going to need for the cake a little bit later on. And uh, if you're watching, we continue to have our uh, Roseberry Coulis uh, reduce. Raspberry. 
Not oh, rosemary. Rose, Although rosemary. Rosemary Cooley. <laughs> raspberry Cooley. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be simmering a little bit in the background because not only does it need to reduce the liquid, it needs to thicken up a little bit. Um, the whipped cream is a Chantilly whipped cream. And what that means is it has a bit of vanilla and some confectioner or um, 10x sugar uh, that's been included in it before mixing. Um, when you see the recipe, I put a quick little note in there. Um, doing whipped cream is pretty simple. You can either do it by hand with a whisk or you can do it in a stand mixer like we are with a whisk attachment. But when it gets to that thickness where it's just on the cusp of being able to stand up by itself, be careful how long you go because very quickly you could have butter, um, which wouldn't be pretty on your dessert. Well, why don't we make the uh, pecans? Yeah. yeah, I'll hand it to you. Cool. Flip it around. Dun, 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 dun. All right, so uh, we're going to make some candy keep pecans. Uh, obviously, just granulated sugar, regular sugar um, that you typically have at home. Pecans. Um, we're going to get our pan heating up here a little bit. Go ahead and put in our sugar. Now, you can do no water whatsoever. As that sugar gets heat, starts heating up, it will uh, melt all by itself. It's a little easier to give it a little jump start with a little bit of water. I'm gonna go ahead and add my, my pecans so they're in there. Um, and I'm just gonna add a little bit of water just around the edges and you'll see it'll just jump start that sugar melting. Didn't take long in a small pan like this to uh, get it up to up to temp uh, and get it boiling. We'll get that all melted, uh, and then um, we've got a uh, well right next to me. <clears throat> a uh, it's a quarter sheet pan with some parchment on it, some more uh, spray on it. Uh, as Cheryl mentioned, a little bit of coconut oil, uh, but any kind of oil is fine. Um, so we're just going to continue to reduce this. Um, now we're going to make sure that all the pecans are covered uh, on all sides. Get that one flipped over. The interesting aspect, Billy, about doing something like this for your charcuterie board is what? The interesting part of it. Yeah, by exactly. adding a candied element to the oh, charcuterie yeah. board. So, yeah, when we're making a charcuterie board, um, you know, we're looking for differences in taste, sweet, um, spicy, um, salty, uh, and, and um, you know, in, in this case, this is the sweet element, but also the texture of it. So you want to bite into um, this uh, pecan, and, and it's going to give you a texture next to the cheese, which may be soft, like a brie. Um, see a little color coming yeah we're not really interested in going all the way to um, a caramel uh, to make a caramel we would add cream to this and that would make it um, soft and chewy what we want to do is when this uh, cools we want there to be a crunch on it so we're just leaving nothing but sugar uh, and I think we're good so I'm going to go ahead and transfer our pecans to the sheet. And now I'm going to go put this in the uh, sink. Otherwise it'll be. Otherwise it'll be a pain in the ass to clean later. Uh, so I can feel they're sticky already, but I'm, I want to separate them as much as possible. Be careful not to touch them because it is melted sugar um, and we just separate them out a little bit um, so they're individual pecans not uh, pralines uh, but that's pretty good uh, so <laughs> we've got our um, raspberry coulis going and you can see it's starting to thicken up some it's got that nice vibrant uh, color to it so we've got a little bit more to go um, just to make sure it's thick enough to where when you do plate your dessert uh, that it has a nice pooling effect 
um, and you end up using it as a sauce. It's fantastic. Yeah. <gasps> that drink. Yeah. I'm jealous. <laughs> I can see the drink. It looks amazing. Gary and Michelle, are you guys ready for us to send it back to you? Send it back. The drink is half gone, <laughs> on, so we may in case someone missed this. I'm going to cook the chicken next. So the beets are in the oven. Uh, I'm going to cook the chicken next. And the idea for the chicken is we're going to cook it on a higher temperature. This is, I would normally, even though it's a lower, um, I think they call it a smoke factor, um, I would normally use, just use my really good olive oil. I'm using some canola oil today because that's what I have on hand. But I'm kind of, I want I want it to be um, a medium high. And the reason for this is because I'm really looking for it to be a beautiful color. I've got, um, these are boneless, skinless chicken thighs, which are my favorite chicken to use for this particular um, salad. There's two reasons for that. Number one, because it cooks um, really fast. You can see that they're smaller pieces, thinner pieces, and um, they're a very moist, it's a very moist uh, cut of the chicken. And so, um, it, it just it has a it just has really big flavor going into this um, particular salad. And again, we get our we buy all of our all of our meat that we can. In fact, all of our beef, chicken, and pork we buy from a local farm. Uh, Chris Country Acres has a farm store about 20, 25 minutes from here, I think. And we run over there. We get all of our chicken. It's from a local local farm. A local farm. Um, so we, as much as possible, the flight, there is definitely a difference. And so what I'm going to do, I'm heating up this on a medium high um, flame. And what I want to do now, uh, the butter is going to go in and then we're going to put the chicken in. The reason for this is because of the, the caramelization and the, the, the color that you mainly get. So we'll let this, um, I'm just going to melt this down really quickly. have to watch it. I mean, you, you want to be ready to do this next step when you do so that you don't burn your butter because the idea is we're looking for that caramelization. I've got some, I've got my chicken here and I had just previously, um, I'm going to put a little bit more. I don't do a lot of um, the butter and the olive. I don't do a lot of seasoning. Just I put some of this on here. I'm going to dredge it in flour to put it into my pan and um, the, I'm going to do that and we're ready to go. I'm going to just dredge it. It's not for flavor. I mean, it's, it's really for how it looks. It's um, so we don't have to, we're not trying to get a coating. We're not trying to get, um, it's not a key factor. I should say in, in the, the chicken itself, it's just, it gives it a beautiful overall color instead of, um, if you don't use it, then it just doesn't have that the beautiful color overall. So I'm putting this in here, just again, just dredging it lightly in the flour. Once I get all of my chicken pieces in here, and I kind of go in the order of how thick my chicken pieces are. I had a couple of there that had a couple of thicker pieces to them. Once I get them all in to my oil and butter and get it on here, then I put, I have put a timer on for three minutes. I call it my long three minutes because the idea um, is that I want it to be cooked enough and if I do it three minutes after I get it all the way in there, then um, I can be assured. I will still check to make sure on my thickest part of my chicken that it's completely cooked. But um, that's, that's all we're going to do. Now we're going to wait three minutes and then turn these over. So Bill, we'll turn it back over to you. Hey, Bill, you're back on, okay? We're back. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, back up. <laughs> we'll check on this. Um, 
So if you were watching, um, what we ended up doing is we strained out the seeds from our coulis and we continue to just reduce it because we want it to be nice and thick. Um, so that's continuing to reduce over here. And then we started uh, ch chopping up or, or uh, slicing some of our meats as we begin. I'm going to turn it over to Cheryl at some point because she's much more of a master at kind of laying out the, um, the charcuterie. Um, in this case, our charcuterie board is a charcuterie pig. <laughs> um, where do we get that? I got it up in um, Rochester, outside Rochester, up when we were visiting your brother. Oh, fun. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so far, um, what we ended up um, buying is we have, um, this one is applewood smoked salami. Uh, we've also cut up some fennel pollen salami uh, and... The last one is a smoked paprika with wine. Um, I thought one of them was chorizo. Nope. Um, Spanish sausage. Um, so obviously these sausages have, um, what, why are you laughing at me? Spanish sausage is the chorizo. Is the chorizo, oh, all right, <laughs> duh. <laughs> Thank you, Cher. Um, they have mold on the outside. Um, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, they're, that's where the flavor comes from. So. Well, it also means that they've been aged. I mean, it, anybody that's seen, um, even in some of our local restaurants, they have a um, place where they actually make their own sausages and hang them. Uh, there is nothing wrong with that rind. It's no different than eating a blue cheese. Um, you know, some molds are good. So the other thing you notice is I'm, I'm cutting these on a bias. Um, no, it obviously doesn't affect the taste whatsoever, but it just gives it a little bit more, um, it's a little fun way to cut it. Uh, then the last meat that we've got on the charcuterie side before we mix to the switch to the cheeses is a um, sugar cured ham. Yeah, that's my homage to North Carolina. <laughs> okay, so. And then uh, let me talk a little bit about some of the cheeses that we've got. Uh, I'm just going to take this out of the package. How's our uh, red? Hey, I'm going to bring you over because it's looking really good. We've still got a little bit more moisture in there than uh, I want. Not quite there yet. So keep doing your thing. Okay. Uh, so follow me over here. I have um, yellow stickies where I wrote notes to myself. Um, so when I think about laying out something like a charcuterie tray, it's all about experimentation. It's not for me to say to you what flavors you like. So um, as a host, um, we want to talk about, um, we talked about, oh, it says chorizo right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so chorizo is typically spicy, right? So we have a... We want to make sure everyone knows that this is the meat that's spicy. Um, uh, fennel is obviously, fennel pollen is going to have that licorice flavor. And now we start talking about our cheeses uh, and then the other things that we compare with it. Um, so the first one I've got here is um, called uh, Beecher's Flagship Block. So I don't know that cheese off the top of my head. So I did a Google earlier today, wrote it on my yellow sticky. It's a cow's milk from Seattle. And the cakes are done. Let's switch. Uh, I'm going to switch around. Cakes are ready. Cakes are ready. Nice little tester. You can use a toothpick. Doesn't matter what you want to do. Go in. If it's clean when it comes out, whether it's the toothpick or that, you're good to go. I typically let my cakes cool in the pan about 10 minutes before flipping them onto a rack to finish fully cooling. And this is why I did this yesterday, so that we would have ample time. I don't like to rush a cake. Uh, they can split on you, they can break, or the edges aren't very pretty. Um, so that's what she looks like. And if you could smell it, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. <laughs> I'll close that drawer. Yep. Just so you know, those are the cakes she made yesterday. <laughs> 
<laughs> Michelle, um, you guys ready or you want us to keep going with some more cheeses? Okay, we're back on. Okay. taking them off and letting them sit for a few minutes. That's just a good um, practice. They'll cut nicely when I put them on the salad and um, they will dry out just a bit. So, all right, so back to you. Great. Um, I wanted to give everybody a peek. The uh, whipped cream is done. You hold that. Okay. Thank you. I mentioned quickly about it being able to stand on its own. That's what you're looking for. Any longer than that, you'd have butter. Um, so I'm actually gonna put this, um, you probably heard the term piping bag, you may already own your own, um, but you know, sometimes it's just easy to use what you have. And a Ziploc bag is a perfect piping vehicle. So I have put one of the corners down and just used a glass to help stabilize it. And now, a nice little shake. You can see we are gonna have a wonderful little piping bag. And I'm actually gonna do a cut in that and we'll do that when we're ready to plate the dessert. I'm gonna put it in the fridge for right now. All right, Billy, what's next on your agenda? All right, let's go back to our cheeses. So I'm going to hand the phone back to you. All right, and then remember, you've got to reduce that balsamic, so that needs to get going. Yep, you're looking at you. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a all right. professional. So when we left off, um, I've got uh, Beecher's flagship uh, cow's milk. It's from Seattle. But the, the important part is we're thinking about explaining to our guests um, what this cheese is like so that they know what they might want to pair it with. Um, it um, has a nutty flavor to it. So it says a unique nutty flavor. Um, so I haven't tried this one yet. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open it up and put it over here and slice it up. And then, as we said, Cheryl's going to um, lay everything out on our charcuterie board. Uh, the next one I've got looks like brie. Um, it is brie. Um, it's French cow's milk, so it's a brie made from cow's milk. Not all brie is made from cow's milk. Um, what you'll get from a brie is buttery, um, a very smooth, very mellow taste. Um, okay, so we'll chop that one up. Um, and then the next one, let me open that up. The next one I've got is a manchego. Am I saying that right, Joe? Manchego. Manchego. Um, this is a manchego from Spain. Um, the description is savory, acidy, um, so. A little sharp. A little sharp, yeah. Um, toothsome, uh, so it's got a little bit of bite to it. 
So you may want to put it with um, something that doesn't also have toothiness to it. Uh, oh, and it says earthy. So mushroom, earthy flavor. Um, hopefully it doesn't taste like dirt. <laughs> no, Manchego is one of my favorites. Okay. But yeah, I can, I can, you know, very firm, firm cheese. The other one I've got here is um, a smoked blue cheese, um, which um, I had left over from before. I, I'm just a big fan of, of blue cheese. Um, I don't remember what kind it is, but everybody kind of knows. What yeah, we got it at Trio. Um, we were just on the hunt for something different. And they said, well, we have this smoked blue cheese. It's a little more mild um, than some of your regular blue cheeses, uh, gorgonzolas and such. And actually, we fell in love with it. All right. So let me cut these real quick. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Cheryl to... Um, I get to do the plating. To plate it. I'm going to bring you over here while he's doing that. You probably know how to cut cheese. Um, you may have noticed that the bowl that we put the sauce in when we made the coulis was in a bigger bowl. It actually had ice in it because what I wanted to do, and you can see how nice and velvety and thick that is now, I wanted to cool down that rapidly so that we'd be able to use it very quickly. Typically what we'll do is when we're done with it, we'll just set it in the fridge um, because we typically aren't using it till later in the day. All right. It's a nice little assortment. <laughs> And I think you have one more component that you need to uh, put on the that? stove. Uh, Michelle and Gary, do you want us to come back to you before as Billy goes ahead and starts that? No, we're good. Okay, well then we'll move on with the um, balsamic vinegar. Okay. Oh, I'm using that. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so I went into the pantry earlier today and turns out I've got a couple different kinds of balsamic vinegar. Um, obviously from the grocery store, these two um, just standard off the shelf uh, balsamic vinegars. Um, balsamic vinegars come in many different levels, um, like wine. Uh, obviously um, from Modena, Italy, um, you can get the That's aged. That's the Mecca. Yeah. I mean, these are balsamic vinegars that can get very expensive. And the older the balsamic vinegar, um, the more intense the flavor. So it's like a, like a reduced balsamic vinegar. It just has done so by sitting in a cask for 25 years or so. But it can get very expensive. If you can afford those things, God bless you, that's fantastic. Um, but if you can't, you can get great flavor with um, just an off-the-shelf balsamic vinegar um, and, and reducing it into a serving. Um, if you've seen the olive oil stores uh, at the mall um, where they have vinegar and olive oil, this is one of those, so it's a blueberry flavored um, balsamic vinegar. It's interesting. Um, it's fantastic on salads. It just gives you that unique kind of fruit forward flavor. Agreed. I'm choosing not to use the blueberry one today. I'm gonna use this one. Um, I'm just gonna put it in a saute pan. Um, I could have just as easily used um, the other um, pan that I had, uh, the, the, pot, sauce pan. the sauce pan, thank you. Um, it will reduce faster in a saute pan because there's more surface area. So I've got that fired up and we'll just let that reduce and we don't need a lot of it. Um, we're just gonna have a little bit drizzled onto our cheese. So what I'm gonna do now is take the phone from Cheryl flip it around and ask her to start plating. Sure, I'll put it together. Go for it. Awesome, awesome. So you may be on yeah, this side. You'll be, you be on this side. Cool. Um, the interesting aspect of putting together the charcuterie, Billy talked to you about the differences in meats and the differences in cheeses and flavor pro profiles. For me, what's the most fun is what I'm combining together. Um, so basically what I try to do on our charcuterie pig is put a variety of the meats separated by the cheeses. I want to encourage people actually to mix and mingle the different flavors, the different textures. Now, I'm going to give a shout out to Mr. Pat McGee. 
Mr. McGee is probably uh, the king of charcuterie. I mean, we have seen the magic at hand and I don't know how he does it, but he certainly can pick and choose and accompany things to perfection. Um, so if you ever have the opportunity to talk to him about charcuterie, be prepared. It's going to be a little fun. He takes his time making his charcuterie. It, and it's, it's a work of art. It really is. And it's uh, worth the wait. All right, Billy, I'm gonna let you uh, take them briefly over and take a peek at your vinegar so they can see what's going on and then you can come back when you're ready. Boiling vinegar. <laughs> so not ready yet. We'll just keep, whoop, sorry, just tip it. See if it's thick enough to where it's a syrupy. It's not there yet. So we'll just let that continue to, uh, continue to reduce. All right. So what's going to go with this? Um, you can see those lovely pecans that Bill candied uh, are already in a bowl. That's giving you that snap of sugar. It's giving you, um, you know, that bit of nut, but a lot of sugar. We also like the idea of olives. And sorry, I forgot a spoon. Olives bring, and these are in an oil, but olives can bring a brine. They can bring that garlicky, garlicky flavored oil they're being bathed in, um, but also the acidity um, and earthiness that an olive can provide. So this is a great accompaniment to any charcuterie board. All right, this is local honey that we get here at Trio. Um, I like honey, especially on a blue cheese. Um, and we just got this yesterday, so it's brand and spanking new. We like to have just a little bit of that available so that if you want to drizzle that and start playing with flavor profiles, you can do so. Billy talked about spice. Um, these are pita chips. They have become, during quarantine, one of our favorite go-tos. They are chipotle and sour cream, but they are spicy. So that's a great one to have. And it gives a little bit of a different color. Um, Charcuterie, as you can tell, especially if you've gone down the sausages route, uh, can be similar in hue. So if you're looking for differences in colors, uh, certainly take a look at the crackers and things you have available. Uh, this is another favorite of ours. Uh, you can pretty much get them anywhere, your favorite grocery store. Um, I know up in Northern Virginia, Giant Food and Wayman's carries them. But they're basically a rosemary sea salt flat cracker. Um, they've got a lot of substance to them. And then Billy's favorite is the uh, standard triscuits. Triscuit. There's nothing wrong with triscuits. I love triscuits. <laughs> All right, Cheryl, I'm going to go over to yeah. the balsamic because we're going to skip the balsamic. <laughs> what did you do? Oh, Lord, Billy. Yeah, it's, I, yeah, it's burnt. Yeah. <laughs> I was watching it from, uh, <laughs> from over there, exactly and it's like, what you want to do. Um, no, 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 we're done. You sure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's a shame because it's really yummy. <laughs> All right, well, then I'm going to put the chutney out. Yep. The thing about um, stuff like that is not ready, not ready, not ready, burnt. Mm, sort of like so. the whipped cream and butter. Right. All right, a little My fault. chutney for spice. Uh, we'll just put this one to the side. <laughs> um, move some of your stuff around. The last thing we like to do is have a little bit of fresh fruit. Um, and then I'm going to talk to you about some nuts and dried fruit. Personally, I like leaving the rind on the pear. But just having that element of fresh fruit is refreshing while you've got all of the heaviness of cheese and meat. Just a nice addition. And so my Mother's Day gift uh, happened to be an assortment of dried fruits and nuts. I wonder who picked that gift for me. <laughs> well done, buddy. All right. So we will incorporate some cashews. Gives a little bit of saltiness. Gives that sweet. And then 
in. I wish we were there with you guys. <laughs> you can be. We're almost we're we're almost neighbors, right? <laughs> A little bit of date. Um, the one that I really liked were the apricots and the pears. This is a dried pear, dried apricots. We certainly can cut those up. Um, but an interesting aspect to this box were um, dried hibiscus. So it looks like it's a part of the flower and they have candied it. Uh, so, you know, talk about color and texture, something like that is also fun. A few little raisins are always good. And then one thing that I didn't put out today, chocolate. Chocolate's always great with any kind of cheese. Um, well, actually with anything. Uh, so think about that. But there is your display of how we typically just put that together. And I know this looks like a lot of food. Um, so we plan on later having some friends over. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you right now that our friends, Chris and Lori, our neighbors across the street, hopefully are watching online because their instructions that were, <laughs> as soon as we're done filming, run across the street and they're going to help us eat all of this cheese and, and meat. So. Absolutely. Shall we give it back to them for the rest of their dish? Yeah. If you guys, Michelle, are you guys ready to plate? We're back. Okay. So one of the one of my favorite things about this particular dish is how forgiving that it is because it is beautiful served at a warm temperature or when the chicken is only slightly warm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start getting my plates ready, um, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to I'll show you what I do with my vinaigrette because I am not a big um, salad dressing person i like to have just that flavor and the best way to do that is to coat your is to coat your salad so i'll show you a little bit about how i do that but i'm going to show you my we, we use this salad dressing all the time and so i tend to have a little bit on hand and i i just keep a jar and every every week or so i completely clean it out but what i do is this is my um go-to vinaigrette which is going to be about one third olive oil or one th one part three parts olive oil to one part um white balsamic vinegar i like just because it has it looks better it's it's um more of an aesthetic thing and then some dijon mustard our favorite store the only place that we actually get our um olive oil these days is from the grand haven uh, vinegar and oil store i'm just about out because of the pandemic so I'm gonna to have to figure out how to get a little bit more, but I'm just, I just put a little bit, that's probably um, a tablespoon. We'll put in a teaspoon of some Dijon mustard and a teaspoon of um, some white balsamic vinegar. Again, I don't have to make very much because we don't use very much on our salads. I just shake it up. Now I'm actually gonna put in just a touch of my favorite salt. Our friend Ruth and Max Bloomquist brought this to us from um, France. They're musicians. They're musicians, yes. I'm gonna pierce some fresh ground pepper in here. I'm gonna do this again. And then I'm just, I'm not going to hardly use any of this on this salad. It just has a really nice consistency to it. So just a little bit of thickness. But what I want it to do, I'm going to put it on here. I'm just going to drizzle. Um, that might be a tablespoon right there. And I'm actually going to, I wash my hands. I'm actually going to use my hands to coat my my lettuce. This lettuce is um, fresh from a farm, from a greenhouse that they keep um, in the winter. We don't get much, um, but every chance that we get, we get all of our um, lettuce or as much as possible in there. I don't know if you can see, but I didn't, looks like I didn't pour very much on, but each one of these pieces of lettuce is coated with this vinaigrette. And it just gives it a really, really nice, oops, there's one that's not, just gives it a really nice flavor. I'm gonna drop maybe another half of the teaspoon on there. 
When I go to, when we order salads out, I always tell the tell them if they can't put it on the side or it's one that needs to be. If you don't think there's enough salad dressing on there, it's probably perfect for me. And then I take for my plates, and I try to take a handful and create a mound there in the middle. Actually had a little bit more than I needed. So then after I wash my hands again, I'm gonna take my um, beets here. Now they've already they've cooled quite a bit. I am going to just um, they're still warm. No, these are not warm anymore. But I only rough chop. I'm not looking for anything. I'm just looking for someone not to need to use a fork. I'm sorry, not to need to use a knife on their salad. That's the only um, purpose. And these actually, um, because I had them sitting in the oven, they're actually a little bit, um, they're a little bit tougher than they would normally be if I didn't have them sitting sitting in there for the hour I had them ready beforehand. And then I take and put a couple of mounds of my beets. I'm gonna take my chicken now and I'm going to slice it. No, actually, so that I don't get red on my chicken as I slice it. I'm gonna wipe that clean. And I'm going to just slice my chicken. Whoops, I'm probably going to do it this way. It's super tender. And I'm going to put it on. Now, Cheryl is an actual real, real cook. I'm more of a kind of taught myself and play around in the kitchen cook. And so she has a much better presentation skills than, um, than I do. Don't let her fool you people. <laughs> We've eaten there. It's phenomenal. I can make it taste good, but I just don't know how to make it. So, <laughs> I forgot goat cheese. Gary and I buy goat cheese in quantities probably most people do not. And this is, oh, you know what I didn't do? But that's okay. I forgot my, my spicy microgreens. So these are spicy microgreens that we got from the farm. Now normally I would put them on. Actually, it's going to look pretty cool. If you haven't used microgreens, there's a, a gazillion. Uh, oh yeah, there's species or whatever you want to call it. So. And there. then I'm going to take my goat cheese, and this is what. I just crumble it up. I can't tell you what the right amount is or how much that I do, but it's probably somewhere around uh, a quarter to a half an ounce per plate. And there you have it. If it was after a show night, in 25 minutes or less, I can have this uh, plate on the table ready to eat. I like a little pepper on mine. Yep, I would definitely like pepper. That looks so yummy, and I got to thinking those microgreens would play nicely with our cheese. Yes, they would. <laughs> oh, my hands are wet. <laughs> Take it away, guys. Great, thanks. Well, we are coming down to the end. Um, Billy's just going to talk just briefly about what we have been uh, drinking here in North Carolina, and then we'll put that cake together. Well, I mean, obviously these cheeses you can pair with anything. With a white, um, we've got a great rosé. What was this? Tell this is uh, Robert Simi out of uh, Simsky, sorry, out of Napa. And it basically is a gris, but it's made with Pinot Noir. So you get that beautiful rosé color. 
and Claude de Bois or Belle Gloss, which is a Pinot Noir out of Oregon, one of our favorites. But the only one I opened <laughs> <laughs> was um, it's a champagne. So um, it is from France. Um, this one, Gaston Chiquet. 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 Kenny uh, can pronounce it. <laughs> yeah. um, so um, I looked this one up classic French champagne. Um, it is 40% Pinot Meunier, M-E-U-N-I-E-R, which yeah. is a, a great, I'm not familiar with. 40% that, 25% Pinot Noir, um, same as this wine, um, and then 35% Chardonnay. Um, so Cheryl and I um, already started. So yeah. we're having a little bit of that with Cheers our Cheers to you guys. I'm going to go ahead and take the camera, mm -hmm. and we'll have Cheryl go ahead and finish up. We're finish up our dessert put it together um i talked a little bit earlier about um the strawberries we use these just came out of the field yesterday uh right up the road from us is a wonderful farm where you can pick your own so tasty um so you think well why would you mess with them well for this dessert it's kind of nice to have just a little bit extra layer of flavor um so i actually took a dessert wine that we opened up it's a Chamberson, um, actually out of uh, Northern Virginia. And it just has this almost balsamic quality to it. Um, and so I, I put a little bit in there and just a touch of sugar. I don't like my berries too sweet, just so that they can macerate a little bit for a couple hours um, before putting this together. Um, I like to do the cake in about a two inch circle. So this is a biscuit cutter. You can use, um, a cookie cutter. This works really well because it actually lifts it at the same time. I took that wonderful, rich, thick uh, raspberry coulis and I put that down as kind of my base and that will be the sauce. And I think I have my scissors. Where did they go? Oh, I put it back. Sorry. Okay. My bad. Okay. Um, and so I took the whipped cream and we're just going to put a little snip on there so that I can create kind of a border, if you will, and this will get all smushed down once I put the layer on top. So that I have a place to put some of my berries. I like to start with just a little bit of that juice and it soaks down inside that cake and then add the berries in with as little juice as possible um, so that you don't get it overly wet. That way, when you take a nice bite into this, you're getting fresh fruit, you're getting the cake, uh, you're getting the whipped cream. And then you take your second layer, and this is why we kind of refer to it as a Napoleon. You're just building these like, layers and these levels. And so that goes on top. <laughs> and a little more whipped cream. Sorry. Stay up there. And then we have been growing mint. Uh, this is a chocolate mint. Um, and we have regular spearmint. You want to just give it a little bit of zhuzh. And it's always nice to give it a little bit of extra fruit. You can just put these around the bottom however you want. Gives it a little bit more dimension. Throw one on the top. And there you go. That's it. That's your dessert. Hopefully you guys will take the time to make this. I will give you one pointer. You'll see you're going to have a bunch of cake left over. Do not throw it away. Put it in a Ziploc bag, throw it in the freezer, and then maybe one Wednesday night after dinner, you don't know what to do. Pull it back out, unthaw it, mix it with some pudding, throw some fruit in it, put a piece of ice cream, you know, scoop somewhere in the middle of it. Make yourself a trifle or a sundae. So I'm going to flip around and um, so there's one thing that we haven't talked about yet that I do want to talk about it's pretty important um, Michelle and Gary so um, seven steps up is an independent music venue uh, and right now um, there are approximately 5,000 independent music venues that are closed across the United States and as you, as you and I were talking about before, these independent music venues were the first to close and they'll be the last to open. 
Michelle, can you talk to us a little bit about um, why a music venue is not a restaurant and it's not a bar? It's, it's a unique thing. It's important to, you know, um, our culture, whether it be here in the United States or anywhere in the world, music is important. Um, you just talk to us a little bit about that. Sure. So as you said, we were the first to close and we'll be one of the first to, one of the last to reopen. And part of that is because of the ecosystem actually that we are, um, all of the venues and all of the artists are connected to each other um, via, you know, probably the best way to say it is tour, right? And so even if Seven Steps Up decided that we were gonna open, we would still need for there to be all of the venues open and uh, uh, an artist to actually tour and make those numbers work. In addition, um, and Gary can probably say it better than I can, but uh, the economics of the... You know, we think when they first let us open, whenever that may be, that they may put a restriction on it. Mask, of, of course, which is a little hard to have your drink. But even, even more difficult is if they say you can open, but you need six-foot distancing, social distance. So we have 130 seats here and we have figured out that if we had to do six foot social distancing we could put 32 seats in uh, and fi financially that's just not viable uh, to in order to pay the bills pay the artists pay our staff uh, so we need a vaccine really <laughs> Yeah, is, is the truth. so there's estimates, you know, that it's going to be six months to 18 months and and probably the smaller venues are going to see the music come back before the big outdoor events or the big indoor arena events that we see. But the, tr the reality of it is, is that we are likely months and months away from that because it's not just seven steps up. All of the venues are in this together. And in fact, the um, there's a, a new organization that came about as doors close called the National Independent Venue Association. You can go to NIVASSO and learn more about them. But it's, it's all the venues in the country coming together and looking for ways to manage through this. They've got um, people in Washington right now advocating on our behalf for some change because the current, um, the PPP, for example, it just doesn't work for someone like and steps up or any of the venues, we're not, we have to expend the funds before we're even going to be allowed to reopen. And, and that just, it, it just doesn't work. And there's nothing, there's not much we can do. We can do these live streams. We did one last night with Brian Dunn that's available on the website. That was good. Um, but there's, there's no, we, there's no curbside experience. For life. Right. Right. And I think that's part of the, you know, it's part of the overall, um, experience everybody's having and will have for some time is making sure you all are there when we can all gather together, however that may look. Um, we've actually put on the screen a banner. Um, we welcome any of our uh, supporters, our followers, the followers and supporters of Seven Steps Up, and most of all, these artists that come and play, they're a magnificent venue. Um, if you want to support them, feel free to go to that link and be part of that GoFundMe. Um, we need you all here when everything opens back up. Um, we, the outpouring from our community and people all across the country to help us in our GoFundMe campaign has been, uh, I, I mean. It's phenomenal. It's, yeah. We, yeah, when we put it up, honestly, when we put it up, we said, well, and, and somebody recommended that we do this and we just, we didn't want to do it. We didn't want to. It's do hard. It. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, even if we, if, if we get a couple thousand dollars over a few months, you know, we will, whatever it is, it'll help. Right. Right. And yeah. Pouring of it is amazing. And one of our community new businesses in town, the Lily mansion, um, there, which is, which is going to be opening up as a bed and breakfast. They through uh, and through a, a nonprofit, Lily Cares, came in this uh, on Friday. I think it was announced, and they announced a ten thousand dollar match for people um, wow. that, as we went from fifteen thousand to twenty five, and uh, and it, it, it's clear that we will surpass anything that we dreamed of. Doing. 
uh, which means we will, I say it's a lot more than a little bit of help from our friends, but we will get by with a little friends. Absolutely. Well, we love you guys. We can't tell you how much we appreciate you being part of this um, and shining a light on Seven Steps Up and the wonderful music that you guys bring to, you know, your area and those of us that travel to get there so that we can be a part of it too. Um, can you give us one last peek at that wonderful dish and I will show the audience what yep. we have on ours as well. We have the dish that we haven't touched yet and Gary's drink, which he's just about done with. <laughs> oh man i wish that we could come over and we could share all this beautiful food together absolutely we're, we're envious of your neighbors across the street yes <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and close things out uh with a little bit of video from uh seven steps up it'll give you a sense of um what they've been doing for a while thank you everybody thank you gary weren't made to be made Really you roll now the way you're supposed to be.